Hi, thanks for joining us online today. I'm Matt and I will be uh, your host through this type of renewal training. Now this training we offered last year and based on a lot of the comments that I received from many of you all, uh, you all seem to enjoy this and want to have this type of training back. So this will be a renewal training for the 2017 year, like you see here. We'll be going over several different things. We've got many topics that are very informative to you and your line of work. Uh, but the first thing that we want to talk about are the renewal requirements. Uh, these are the rules that you're required to follow in order to renew an individual license. Uh, so we'll be going over those first. So the first thing are the prerequisites that are involved with the rules. Um, those prerequisites consist of owing no outstanding fees or fines. So if you still have some fees that you haven't paid for, for maybe not notifying the local office of starting or not submitting your paperwork in time, those fees will need to be paid before we can renew a license. Secondly, you have to be in compliance with the income tax laws of the state. So pretty soon we'll be receiving that list from the tax commission of who is not in compliance. If you're not in compliance, then we'll have to make sure that you get into compliance first before we can renew. And then lastly, you have to be in compliance with any orders uh, issued by the agency. So if you've got an outstanding uh, notice of non-compliance or received a final order from us, then we'll have to get that settled up first before we can renew a license. Okay, so those are the prerequisites. The requirements that you're required to follow are um, you have to complete the renewal application and I'm going to tell you, the renewal applications are going to be dated for December 15th. So those should be received by you. It will have everything on file that, that we have for you uh, you need to verify that information, add the fee that's owed, and then send that to the Oklahoma City office. Okay? The next thing is that you also have to pay the annual certification fee. I just talked about including that, so the certification fee will be required. And then lastly, the documentation of the required renewal training. Um, if you're watching that, the video here today, uh, this will serve as documentation of your renewal training. Otherwise, uh, s several have attended conferences throughout the state this year or even attended conferences outside the state. But whatever it is, you'll need to make sure that you document that with us in order to renew your license. Uh, so all of this information is due to the Oklahoma City office by January 15th of 2017. Anything comes in after that, we're going to have to tack on a $50 late fee. So make sure you get that to us and you can submit that either via mail email or fax, okay? Um, so need to make sure we get that in. Lastly, if you have any questions about your uh, license, please contact April Messer here in our Oklahoma City office. She'd be more than happy to help you out. Uh, her, her information is available right here, so feel free to contact her. Otherwise, stay tuned. We're going to get started with some interesting topics uh, that will help you be able to uh, perform your job better, um, maybe provide some useful information that you can provide to your customers and in the end we end up helping out the environment, okay? Hello everyone and welcome to SunUp. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin this morning talking about something that a lot of people in Oklahoma have to deal with from time to time, and that is their septic system. Joining us now is Sergio Abbott, one of our soil scientists here at OSU. And Sergio, you and your team have put together a new extension project mm -hmm. behind us, mm -hmm. obviously a series of septic systems. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the background. Well. Um 40% of houses in Oklahoma have septic systems, and these are houses that are not connected to a city sewer. If you don't receive a, a sewer bill, you probably need a septic system. That 40% um, figure is quite significant because uh, the national average for houses with septic systems is only 20%. So we have a lot of septic systems in Oklahoma, but just like, you know, anything that is waste, that's considered waste, we deal with it and we tend to forget about it. So this facility is the first of its kind here in Oklahoma and, you know, right in the area. And uh, we want to use this in training the people who are involved in the industry and also to be used as educational uh, facility for kids, for, uh, for high schoolers maybe, even for home, home, uh, homeowners. And one of the questions I asked you was, are you an engineer? 
and you are actually a soil scientist. Yeah. Talk about the importance of the soil in deciding what kind of system you need in the first place and how it's maintained. In, in all of these systems, uh, the ultimate recipient of the waste, the, treat, the one that treats the waste, is actually the soil. And rules in Oklahoma um, as, that pertains to septic systems is largely dependent on the soil. So the decision as to what system needs to be installed in the area is, is largely dependent on what type of soil, what is the thickness of the soil, and how effective is that soil to, in treating wastes. Okay. And I know I'm a novice, but typically these are all underground, correct? These are, these are not underground, yes. But for educational purposes, they're above ground. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We want uh, people here to actually touch it, see it, and of course look inside the tanks and walk around it and have a good understanding of how they work. Yeah. Let's talk about each of these different models that you have here, starting okay. with this one here. All right. That one right there, that is what we call a, 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 a conventional system. Everything is driven by gravity. Uh, that is the most common across the nation, uh, most very common in Oklahoma as well. So if you have perfect soils, good area, thick soils, we rely on gravity to distribute uh, the wastewater across the field. So those pipes are actually underground and they distribute uh, water underneath. Uh, but that's if you have perfect soils. If you don't have perfect soils, we rely on something else to improve the distribution. So we pressurize the system. This is the system right here, which we call low pressure dosing. Pressure is used to distribute the water more evenly. Uh, but not, if none of these would work, and if you have bad soils, clay soils, thin soils, small area, well, we, we rely on you know even more advanced systems like the one that we have here. This is what we call the aerobic treatment system. Uh, so there's a lot of um, electronics and mechanical parts in it. It's a bit expensive and requires a lot of upkeep. But then again, it allows you to build houses in areas that have bad soils. Like you mentioned, this is this is something we don't think about until too much until yeah. it stops working, and yes. then it's uh, it's pretty much all your attention goes to that. So there must be a real need for training opportunities of all ages, correct? Correct. Um, and um, most of the time. Um, problems arise if it's not installed correctly and if it's not maintained correctly. So talking about installation, we have to train our installers to do that, to do the installation in the best way possible. And we also have to train our homeowners that, hey, you have to maintain this and what better way of training than showing them mock-ups of how things work so that we can, we can train them how to properly care for their systems. Tell me about the panels that we see in the back here. Uh, those panels are um, mock-ups or representations of what, 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 what we have installed in the subsurface. Uh, those, this, this lines right here, they're pipes, they're actually underground, but those are cross-sections of, of what we will find in the subsurface. You can see like pipes and around it is gravel, so the wastewater actually moves into the gravel before they would move into the soil for final treatment. And if you have various types of different types of soils, well, you will have different types of below ground trenches. So that is basically um, what it represents. Terrific. Well, best of luck as it progresses and, and keep us posted. Maybe we would need a little training too, the SUNUP team. Who knows? Who okay. Knows? Sergio, thanks so much for your time. And for more information on soils and projects like this in Oklahoma, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Soil texture is a very important property of soils. Texture generally refers to how rough or smooth something is, and soil texture specifically refers to how much sand, silt, and clay is in a given soil sample. If a person wanted to determine how much sand, silt, and clay was in a soil sample, they could send it off to a soil testing laboratory, or with practice, they could learn how to determine texture by feel. I'm standing in a soil pit that was dug with a backhoe for a visit from some school children. This certainly isn't required for doing texture by feel. You can use any kind of soil sample. Certainly one dug from a field or from a flower bed using a spade or a knife would be fine. So I'm going to start by taking my spade and digging a little bit of soil out of the top part of this soil pit, which we are out of the soil profile, which we would call topsoil. Put my spade down and break it up a little bit. 
I'm starting out with moist soil. Break up some of the pieces, which we would call aggregates or peds. I'm going to add a little bit of water from a spray bottle. And the goal is to work this up into, until it has the texture of, say, or the consistency of Play-Doh or putty. So take and mash out all of these chunks with our hands until we get it to that right consistency. Now if you add too much water, um, it, it'll be too soft. It'll, be, it'll just mush and stick to your hands so you can add more soil. Grab a little more soil and add it. Or you could simply set it in the sun and let it dry out just a little bit. It, it's, it dries out very fast in the sun, so it, it would just take a minute or two. We want to take and work all of the chunks out of the soil so that it becomes smooth with the consistency of, of silly putty or Play-Doh. And all of the chunks are worked out of it so it's very smooth, as smooth as possible. And if your soil contained rocks, big rock fragments, something greater than two millimeters, you would want to remove those first with a sieve. So now I've worked the soil up into the right consistency and I'm ready to try to make the ribbon. And so what I'm going to do is take this ball and press it between my thumb and my index finger and you can do this on either hand, your left or your right, whichever you prefer. And the goal is to press it and make a long continuous ribbon until the soil breaks under its own weight. The most important part about making a ribbon, this is what people have the hardest time with, is pushing it into the right part of your hand. The right place to put it is into the second knuckle. So the second knuckle down from the fingernail is your goal. So you take the thumb, pull it back, and press that soil, that putty, right into that second knuckle down from the fingernail, right into that V of your finger. And so push it out and then kind of unstick both fingers, the index and the thumb, and push it again. And push it out like kind of backing down the tracks. And so you see how this ribbon is standing up underneath its own weight. That's how we're going to determine the length of ribbon, how long it can go until it breaks underneath its own weight. So we made a ribbon about, about two inches long, I'd say, before it broke from its own weight. And you might want to measure that with a a tape measure if you're doing this yeah, out in the field or, or just learning, but that's approximately two inches. Ribbon length gives an indication of how much clay the soil contains. And the textural triangle can be split into three tiers. The uppermost tier is very clay. The center tier is moderately clay. And the bottom tier isn't very clay at all. So if I ribbon this out and for this sample, it's in excess of two inches long. This tells me that that sample is, contains a lot of clay. If I were to break this off, a sample that was, made, that was more like uh, one to two inches long might be in the center portion of the textural triangle. And if it broke after just a very short time, that would be on that bottom tier of the textural triangle. Now that I've determined the ribbon length, which is going to tell me something about the amount of clay in the soil, the next step is to break off a small pinch of our uh, texture ball, set that down over here, and then I'm going to put it into the palm of my hand and add water. Kind of make a pool or a pond of water in my palm. Add plenty of water and then take your fingers from your other hand, and from the opposite hand, and rub that sample. By rubbing this sample, my goal is to answer the question, how gritty or how much sand does a sample contain? And really all that's necessary is to decide if it's very gritty, moderately gritty, or not very gritty at all. And that'll help us determine the class by using the textural triangle. Texture by feel is a skill that takes practice to learn. So don't be discouraged. Practice with samples from your fields or your flower beds and you'll get the hang of it in no time. Okay, so this section we're going to talk about ethics and um, the question may not necessarily be why talk about ethics but why not talk about ethics because to gain credibility personal respect and admiration from others 
we should not just follow the laws, we also have to work within ethical standards. And to be frank, uh, you know, I've received several comments from different individuals throughout the different programs criticizing others within their own field, whether it's somebody they feel is is cutting corners or not doing the job that they're supposed to do or somebody is offering a service that may not necessarily be best for the homeowner and feel wrong by that somehow. So maybe it's time we do discuss ethics and what ethics means. Um, So we've looked through some literature and found some references that we use to to create this ethics module. Uh, So to talk about ethics first thing you have to understand is that we represent the state when we deal with our stakeholders. It's not just DEQ employees that represent the state, but anybody to whom we issue a license also represents the state. We issue that license um, to to license individuals to follow the rules for the on-site program. So that's what a license does. So then in the last part of the sentence, has to deal with our stakeholders so you have to understand who the stakeholders are so when we think about the on-site program and who we represent who who are the stakeholders that we deal with on a day-to-day basis well one is our clients and that's going to be the citizens of Oklahoma those are the individuals that pay taxes so we have a on-site program and then the second stakeholder is the environment we're in the business of protecting the environment while addressing the needs of those clients of the citizens so those are two important things to remember our clients are the citizens and the environment is that which we are protecting so what do ethics do ethics address the moral duties and obligations that we have in society these are the things that we determine to be acceptable behavior or what's right and wrong these are all defined within ethics with the goal of achieving the maximum good for all people not just for one person or one particular group or one particular program. The whole goal is to achieve the maximum good for for all people. And ultimately, we make decisions every day that build or weaken credibility, personal respect and admiration for others. It's hard to believe that just one little choice or one little decision that that is made can, can affect each and every one of these things. So let's talk about the difference between ethics and law. Okay, so law includes punishment for offenders as part of a judicial process. Um, Obviously, there is punishment for breaking a law, and there are people in place to uphold that law and to prosecute that law. Ethics, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Ethics do not include an objective review of one's actions or any type of structured punishment procedure. Ethics are based on what's the maximum good for all. And even though that it's less structured and less formal than laws, ethics influence our lives as much or perhaps even more than laws. So those individual choices or those individual decisions that we make each and every day ultimately can influence how we act or or how we deal with things even more than uh, complying with the law does. So let's talk about ethics and individuals within industries. So the actions of individuals performing services within an industry ultimately determine public perception of that industry. That makes sense. The the integrity of each person is important because the actions of a single person can affect the long-term viability of an industry. And that's that's very true. There's been some recent cases where maybe leaders of particular a uh, corporation or something has come out in the press as being considered uh, crooked or or somebody that hasn't been doing the right thing. Well, the public perception is that that particular corporation or that industry ultimately um, it, they don't have they, they don't they don't um, hold the, the public's perception very high at all. Uh, maybe they can cons- consider that industry to be corrupt. Uh, so it's important at the end of each day to know that each and everything that I do, I've done in the best interest of not only uh, my clients, my stakeholders, but for my industry in, in general. Um, so let's look at 
how ethics and society are considered to be kind of in a terrible state. So the Barna Group performed a survey. They, they surveyed the general public and asked them whether or not they considered these leaders to, to hold their complete confidence. And these are the results. And you can see that there's not very many there that are held in the public's complete confidence. Teachers, they, they're not even, they're the highest on this list, but they're not even considered uh, very many to hold the public's complete confidence. So that tells us something. That tells us that ethics are in a terrible state. So the next question would be, why are ethics in such a terrible state? So the first reason that ethics are in a terrible state is because ultimately people are going to pursue what's convenient for them. They're not going to think about other people at all. It's only what they want to do. And oftentimes we choose the path of least resistance. And in doing so, we could cut corners in doing our jobs. That's so true for, for so many different programs. You know, maybe, maybe if, I, if, if I don't f follow this one little part of this rule, that's going to make this job a little bit easier. So I'm not going to worry about it. Well, that's why ethics can be considered in such a terrible state. Sometimes we give ourselves permission to cut corners because we rationalize that it's just a one-time uh, issue and the goal or the purpose justifies our, our cutting corners. You know, maybe, maybe I'm not going to incorporate uh, some health and safety procedures for my business because, you know, it's not always going to happen. It might just happen once and the, and the likelihood of, of something bad happening is not very high. So, you know, I may not do that. So I'm giving myself permission to cut that corner because in my mind I'm saying it's only going to be a one-time deal. Secondly, ethics are in a terrible state because ultimately people do what they must in order to win. Most people hate losing. Nobody wants to come out as second best or nobody wants to lose out on on, on, on getting a big job or anything like that. Few people start out with the desire to be unethical, but even fewer people start out with the mindset that it's all right to lose. I think when you talk about uh, sacrificing what something, how something makes you feel, whether or not you feel good at the end of the day uh, can really affect whether or not uh, you're going to be an ethical person. So those are a couple things there to remember. Third, ethics are in a terrible state because we rationalize choices with relativism. Um, in no-win situations, people decide what's right according to or what relative to their circumstance or standards. Okay, so people decide that according to how they feel, this is what's best for them. That's what relative means. Each person has their own relativity, so to speak, or relativism. The problem with this is that everyone has their own standard, and this changes with time and maybe with the situation. Ultimately, one day how you feel about something, the next day you may feel totally different, and that's relative to each person. So this chosen course of action may not be for the maximum good of all. If it's always changing, how can you ever have any sort of consistent standard there? So how do we deal with it? How do we deal with an ethical dilemma? Uh, how do we get the um, how do we get the the state of ethics back into a good state? Okay, so let's talk about using the one rule for everyone. You've often heard this as you, the golden rule. And what the golden rule does is it allows you to achieve a maximum good for all. So let's, let's look at the golden rule. The golden rule cuts across cultural, religious, and social boundaries. And most people refer to this golden rule as do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Okay, Treat one person the same as you would treat yourself. And this cuts across all those cultural, and religious, and social boundaries. If you look at different types of of relig religions, they all have this one verse or this one tenet or this one standard uh, that talks about treating people the way you want to be treated. And so I think that's important. You know, if you have this one standard that can cut across all of those things that everybody can agree to, secondly, it becomes easy to understand. 
You know, you don't need to study the law to know how you want to be treated. All you simply do is imagine yourself in place of another person. And there's no complicated rules or, or loopholes associated with that. So then that brings up the next challenge. How do we translate the golden rule into dealing with environmental ethical dilemma or, or, or situations that are difficult within our on-site sewage program? How do we translate the golden rule? So first thing we have to do is, is remember who the target is. Our actions should be for the maximum good of the environment. Um, so why not apply that golden rule ph philosophy and how we make decisions that affect the environment? So it will allow us to replace a few words here with environment. So whatever you want the environment to do to you, do also to the environment. Hurt not the environment with that which pains yourself. So there are, are, are many things that we can do um, to help satisfy ethical standards for this for this industry you know we can feel better about ourselves and about our customers and about the environment at the end of the day so the key point here is that we cannot really separate people the client from environment the client ultimately they're both our stakeholders if we're going to be ethical people and understand who those stakeholders are our clients and the environment are the same so we apply the golden rule for both. So that way, in all these little decisions that we make, whether or not I'm going to complain about my competitor or whether or not I'm going to cr criticize a particular uh, new technology that's been introduced that's a fix-all for everyone, um, you know, let's think about it on the, in the long term and with an ethical standard of how is this going to affect the environment? or how is this going to affect my been in business for 14 years and I'm a septic installer and operation and maintenance specialist. A person doesn't realize how quickly they can become injured and how trivial of a little item that can cause serious damage. So we must be aware on our job all the time uh, with regards to safety. Hey, good morning, Val. Good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you doing this morning? Doing great. Excellent, doing great. excellent. Looks like we're going to have another busy day today. Perfect. That's what I like to hear. Martin? Yeah. Did you see this article about a guy that died in a septic tank in Renton? That's the outfit I told you I worked for before starting here. That place was an accident waiting to happen. Old man was more concerned about making money than he was safety. Can't believe something like this didn't happen before. Well, I'm glad that I'm not the one that had to make the phone call to the family. Mm. I can't imagine the pain they're going through. Right. You know, it makes the safety program that we're working on super smart. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what? I vote we grab Chuck and a few of the other guys and have a safety training session. I like it. You know, I knew there was a reason I hired you. Of course. <laughs> well, let's go do this. All right. Safety is very important to me uh, as a, because I'm a, a victim of an industrial injury. Um, at one time, I was climbing down a ladder, uh, although I had safety gear on when I released it, the ladder slipped and I was injured very badly. Hey guys, so you may have heard the story that Val uh, read about in the, in the paper this morning about this guy that got killed in a septic tank over on the east side. 
and she thought it'd be a good idea if we just went through our confined space entry procedures so that we're kind of up to snuff on what you guys are doing. We're going to start out with the confined space entry permit. That's the beginning of how you evaluate not only the site that you're working in, but also the actual confined space or the tank that you're going to be going down into. So when you look at your, your uh, form that you have, it goes through and it has some things that it wants you to fill out. Um, identifies the purpose of the entry, who the crew is, who the supervisors are, how you're going to communicate while you're doing the job, and then goes into looking at all of the individual evaluation that you need to do for personal protective equipment that you need while you are uh, doing the confined space entry itself. So when you look at how you're going to, or what you need to do to protect yourself while you're in the tank, there's a couple of simple approaches to take a look at it. So when you look at what is it on your head that you want to protect, it may be your hearing, maybe your eyes, and you can have a set of goggles. The kind of goggles you use are important. Are you going to be using uh, goggles that will protect you from things splashing back, or do you need to have glasses that will protect you from uh, just impact? Uh, my injury affected me both emotionally and, of course, physically. Uh, a person cannot imagine the strain that you have on, on your life when you cannot provide for your family. When you're in a tank, a lot of times it's a short height and then there's a lid in there that's made out of concrete. If you stand up too quick or if you move, you can get bunked in the head and you want to have some kind of protection for the top. You can have a full-on safety helmet, but also in a confined space, um, there are, uh, an alternative would be just a standard little bump cap. Creation of aerosols when you're in the confined spaces that we work in is an important part of making sure that you have adequate protection for, in particular because of contaminated tanks, ones that are used that you're doing tank repairs and some of that kind of work on, you're often creating aerosols and potentially with the uh, mechanical air supply, you want to have some protection against the biological pathogens that are in raw sewage that are in these tanks after you've cleaned them out as best you can. An N95 or an N100 mask is probably the most important piece of PPE that you can use to protect you against inhaling um, some of these pathogens that are aerosolized inside this tank. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of hand protection that you want to use and the choices that you have because there's a couple of options. When you're inside of a tank, the first level of protection that you want to have is a nitro glove that has um, a minimum grade for uh, protecting you against pathogens. These are gloves like nurses use in doctor's offices. They're examination grade gloves and so these are the ones that you have available as your base layer. When you're working in rough areas or moving uh, big pieces of equipment or pumps inside of a tank, having a heavier grade glove over the nitro glove helps protect you even more. A lot of times it's not uncommon for you to get bumped up against the concrete and sharp edges and stuff inside these tanks and if you get a cut or a uh, scrape or something on your hand, that becomes an entry vector for some of these biological pathogens that are in these tanks. Once you're hurt, you, you don't even know if you're really going to truly recover until one day you finally are able to get up. I, for me, I couldn't walk for a number of, for a year almost. Okay, and then when you're in a tank, another piece of protective equipment that you want to think about having available is a Tyvek suit. When you're working in a clean tank, it's less important and your regular work clothes will suffice. But when you're in that contaminated tank, then uh, doing a tank repair or some other kind of work like that, you really want to have some kind of protective outerwear that goes over your clothing. The reason for that is so that when you get out of the tank and you've got contaminated um, water and liquid on your pants and clothing and everything, you don't transmit that into the cab of your truck, back to the shop, and even in some cases all the way home to your laundry cycle. It's important for you to do as much as you can to protect yourself and your family against the pathogens that you're exposed to. Okay, so now we've talked about all the personal protective equipment that you'll use for your body. Now we need to check the environment that you're going into. And this is the tool that you use. This is an air quality monitor and you use it two ways. First you'll use it to check at three different levels in the tank. Because some gases are lighter than air, some are heavier than air, you check at the top, the middle, and the bottom. Andy, all right, you got this? So um, you're going to check at these three levels and then once you've got that done and you don't have any alarms, then you're clear to 
start setting up the tripod, get into the harness, and then the next thing you'll do is you'll attach the air quality monitor up here on your collar within about a six to nine inch area of your mouth because that's where if you're going to have a problem with gases it's going to be right here you want to know about it right away. The next two pieces of equipment that we're going to be talking about is the tripod that supports you and while you're going into the into the tank and then the harness that you're going to be wearing when you are um, being lowered attached to the cable into the confined space. This is a really important part of getting in and out of the tank particularly if you need to do a non-entry rescue. So before you put these on, every time you use them, inspect this harness. And while it may be dirty, that's okay, but you want to make sure all of the straps aren't frayed and that the equipment is in uh, good shape you know, physically that way. Another thing you're going to want to do is to inspect the cable so that you make sure that there aren't any kinks or any frays in it. A real easy way to do that is if you run your hand up the cable, if there's a loose end on it, it's going to stab you in the hand. An important part of setting up the tripod is making sure that the feet are wide enough that you've got a good solid base and also that they're wide enough so that when you're hanging and suspended in the middle of this over the hole of the tank that you're going to go into that you're able to go into the space without banging up against any of the equipment. It's important for that also because somebody may have to yard you out of the hole and you don't want to have to make it harder for them than it is. Another important piece of setting this up is that this cable runs up over the top of the tripod and wheels. The main thing you want to look for are these pins that are inserted up on top that are the keepers that are retention pins to hold the cable in place so it doesn't travel out of the, um, out of the track that it's in. You getting this? Oh yeah. All right. Okay. After you've got the tripod set up and the legs extended to the proper distances, the next step is to attach the winch to the uh, leg of the tripod. With these clips here, you um, enter these pins into these holes at the elevation that you want and then um, loop these over and then this is secure. This then goes on up to the pulley at the top and the cable then continues on through and is connected to the harness um, in, in the middle. To lower it, you just crank the handle. To raise it, you just take it back the other way. Okay, so we've talked about personal protective equipment for your body. We've talked about the equipment that's going to keep you safe, taking you in and out of the tank. We've talked about the air quality monitoring for checking for gases and oxygen levels inside the tank. The next thing we want to do is talk about air supply while you're in there. What this unit does is it's an air blower and you put it on one of the entry points in the tank. Tanks are configured differently, so you'll have to figure out and decide which is the best place to put air into the tank, but it should be if it's a compartment that is separated from another compartment in the tank, the compartment that you're working in. So you want the air to be basically blowing into the same space that you're in, um, in the confined space, in the tank. Another important piece to this um, is the volume of air that these are able to produce. If you have a tank that is large, you need to be able to turn the air over a minimum of five times. This needs to have a, a volume throughput of cubic feet per minute that will accomplish that in the tank. It's really important to make sure that you match the blower that you have with the tank size that you have. Okay guys, that's it. Check your job sheets for the equipment that you need. Make sure you've got everything to keep you safe and have a good day. Everybody, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this. This is really important stuff. Hey guys, pay close attention to these things. These things will save your lives. That's right. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's go. I think that went really well, yeah. I, except for Andy. Did you see him? He spent more time fiddling with his phone than he did listening. Yeah, I saw that too. I vote we call him in. These guys have got to know how to do this thing right, Val. My brother-in-law is a pilot, and he says that they practice safety and response all the time. That way, if something goes wrong, people aren't in a panic, and they know what to do. Well, I vote 
we drop kick anyone who cannot be trusted to save their own life. Well, that's something I can vote on. All right. Andy, to the front office, please. Andy, office. All right, so how are we doing with uh, this? The number one consideration in safety for me is peace of mind, uh, both peace of mind for uh, myself and for my employees. With regards to safety, money shouldn't be a consideration because what you save by your safety um, meetings saves money in the long run, both in employee safety and employee uh, health. So thank you for watching those videos. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you got some information out of them. Um, if you have any comments or if you have any uh, questions about it, feel free to contact me. My information is going to be right up here. Um, if you've got some suggestions on how we could offer a different type of training, I would love to know that as well. So as far as documenting your, um, your viewing of this renewal video, let's talk about that. So. On your um, renewal application, there will be a line there that has a place for you to provide the documentation. Um, and on that line, I want you to put a documentation code word uh, or a password, okay? So what that password is, is this right here, 2017 renewal. That is the word that you will place on your renew renewal application to show that you actually watched this video and can document that you watched it. So there it is, 2017 renewal. Put that on the application, send it in to us, and then we can uh, make sure that we get your, your application processed and a license issued for the next year. Thank you for your time, and we hope to see you soon.